The foot, chronic or overuse injuries. Chronic or overuse injuries typically occur over a period of time. Calcaneal stress fractures, the etiology. The stress fracture or a stress reaction occurs in the calcaneus or heel bone. This occurs due to repetitive trauma and is characterized by a sudden or gradual onset in the plantar calcaneal area. Common signs and symptoms include pain during weight bearing, particularly at the heel strike of the gait sequence. Patients will complain of pain following continuous exercise and the individual may require a bone scan for further diagnosis. Stress fractures will not always appear on x-rays, particularly when they're fresh. Most of the time, a stress fracture has to be in the healing phases of the injury in order to be seen on x-ray, so bone scans are better analysis techniques. The management is conservative for two to three weeks, including rest and active range of motion exercises. Non-weight-bearing cardio training, such as a pool workout, should continue to help the athlete or the patient maintain cardiovascular fitness. As the pain subsides, activity can gradually be returned. An apophysitis of the calcaneus, also known as Seaver's disease. The etiology is a traction injury at the apophysis of the calcaneus where the Achilles tendon attaches. At the tendon attachment site on the calcaneus, the attachment is pulling off of the calcaneal bone. The bone is trying to maintain the attachment site and thus will lay down additional calcium, resulting in a calcium formation on the back of the calcaneus. Signs and symptoms include pain that occurs on the posterior heel below the Achilles tendon attachment in children and adolescent athletes. This pain occurs during vigorous activity and ceases following that activity, so pain decreases with rest. The management, this condition is best treated with ice, rest, and NSAIDs, over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. A heel lift that is placed in the shoe could also relieve some of the stress. Placed on the calcaneus from the pulling Achilles tendon. Retrocalcaneal bursitis, the etiology. This is an inflammation of the bursa beneath the Achilles tendon. A bursa is a fluid-filled sac that decreases the tension and the stress of tendons and muscles as they slide over bony structures. In a bursitis, the bursa swells. This results in increased pressure and rubbing of the shoe heel counter on the heel. This can develop into a chronic condition that develops over time and may take extensive time to resolve. An exostosis, also known as a Haglund's deformity, which is essentially a bony outgrowth on the heel, may develop. The signs and symptoms. There is pain with palpation above and anterior to the Achilles tendon insertion and the individual will often have swelling on both sides of the heel cord. The management is use of NSAIDs as needed, and ultrasound can help reduce the inflammation. Routine stretching of the gastrocnemius and Achilles tendon and the use of heel lifts can reduce stress, as well as a donut pad can help reduce pressure from the heel counter of the shoe. If this condition persists, some patients may benefit from investing in larger shoes with a wider heel contour to help take the pressure off this area. Tarsal tunnel syndrome. This is an area behind the medial malleolus that forms a tunnel with the osseous floor and roof composed of the flexor retinaculum. The etiology is any condition that compromises the tibialis posterior, flexor hallucis longus, flexor digitorum, and the tibial artery, nerve, and tibial vein. This can result from previous fracture, a tenosynovitis, which is an inflammation of any part of the tendon, or from acute trauma. Signs and symptoms of tarsal tunnel syndrome include pain and paresthesia, 
which means numbness or tingling, along the medial and plantar surface of the foot. This condition may also result in motor weakness, meaning that the individual is going to have trouble moving, and atrophy, a shrinking of the muscles. There is increased pain at night with a positive Tenel sign. Tenel's sign is tapping over this area, which reproduces the numbness or tingling from the neurological symptoms. The management is anti-inflammatory medication and modalities, orthotics, and possibly surgery if the condition does not get better or becomes reoccurrent. Pes planus and pes cavus are two different arch conditions. Pes planus is also known as being flat-footed. The etiology is associated with excessive pronation, four-foot varus, a weakening of the supportive structures, being overweight, and excessive exercise placing undue stress on the arch. Pes planus can also be associated with wearing shoes that are too tight for the individual. Signs and symptoms may include pain and weakness or fatigue in the medial longitudinal arch. This is the main arch underneath the foot. The management for pes planus. If this is not causing an individual pain or symptoms, then nothing should be done to correct the problem. We wait until this condition is symptomatic or causing the individual issues before we address this issue. If a problem develops, orthotics should be constructed with a medial wedge and or taping of the arch can also be used for additional support. Pes cavus is known as a high arched foot. The etiology is a higher arch than normal and may be associated with excessive supination for the individual. This is essentially an accentuated high medial longitudinal arch. The signs and symptoms include poor shock absorption, resulting in metatarsalgia, which means that there is numbness and tingling among the metatarsals in the foot. Foot pain and clawed or hammer toes are also common. It is not uncommon for a patient with pes cavus to have a tight Achilles tendon and plantar fascia. The plantar fascia is on the bottom of the foot. Typically, heavy calluses will develop on the ball and the heel of the foot as these are the only structures of the foot that come into contact with the ground during weight-bearing activity. The management for pes cavus or a high arched foot if this is asymptomatic, meaning there is no symptoms and is not bothering the patient, then no attempt should be made to correct this condition. If this condition is bothering the patient or is symptomatic, then orthotics should be used if problems develop, typically involving a lateral wedge. Stretching of the Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia can be extremely helpful. Morton's toe. In Morton's toe, there is an abnormally short first metatarsal, which makes the second toe look longer. More weight bearing then occurs on the second toe and can impact gait, as the toe off then frequently goes through the second toe instead of the big toe. In cases such as this, it is common for stress fractures to develop in our patient. Signs and symptoms may include the patient complaining of pain during or after activity with possible point tenderness over the fracture site. Bone scans could be positive for a fracture, especially a stress fracture. A callus will frequently develop under the second metatarsal head as more pressure is placed through this area. If there are no symptoms for the patient, then we leave this alone and nothing should be done. If it is associated with a structural forefoot varus, then orthotics with a medial wedge would be very helpful for our patient. Plantar fasciitis. This is a common issue for athletes and non-athletes alike. This can be attributed to heel spurs, plantar fascia irritation, and even bursitis. 
Plantar fasciitis is a catch-all term used for pain in the proximal arch and the heel. The plantar fascia is a dense, broad band of connective tissue that attaches proximally to the medial surface of the calcaneus and fans out over the plantar aspect of the foot to the metatarsal heads. This works to maintain the stability of the foot and bracing of the longitudinal arch. For the etiology, there is an increased tension and stress that is placed on the fascia, particularly during the push-off phase of running. There are many reasons why plantar fasciitis could develop. Some of them may include changing from rigid supportive footwear to flexible footwear, poor running techniques, or even conditions that include things like leg link discrepancies, excessive pronation, an inflexible longitudinal arch, and even a tight gastrocnemius or soleus complex. Individuals will frequently report signs and symptoms with associated pain in the anterior medial heel. Many will complain of increased morning pain, which lessens after the first few steps out of bed in the morning. There is also an increased pain with forefoot dorsiflexion. The management for plantar fasciitis is extended treatment and may last for 8 to 12 weeks. Orthotic therapy can be useful to help support the plantar fascia. Simple arch taping and the use of a night splint with the foot in a dorsiflex position can maintain a position of a static stretch, which decreases the stretch on the foot when the patient steps out of bed in the morning. Vigorous Achilles tendon stretching and exercises that increase great toe dorsiflexion can be helpful. NSAIDs and occasionally steroidal injections are sometimes used to address this condition. Metatarsal stress fracture. Any of the metatarsals can be fractured as a stress fracture. However, the second metatarsal is one of the most common. This is also known as a Marches fracture. This is usually from a change in running patterns, an increase in mileage, running hills, or running on a harder surface than normal. Many individuals that have this type of condition have a forefoot varus, hallux valgus, flat-footedness, or a short first metatarsal. Fifth metatarsal fractures happen at the insertion point of the peroneus brevis muscle. Signs and symptoms of metatarsal stress fractures. Over two to three weeks, the patient will develop a dull ache that occurs during exercise, and it progresses to pain at rest. This progresses from a diffuse pain, meaning it's difficult to pinpoint, to a localized pain. Patients will often report an increase in duration and or intensity of training prior to the injury. The management, a bone scan may be necessary. Typically, two to four days of partial weight-bearing is followed by two weeks of rest. We then return the individual to running, and that should be a gradual return. Orthotics should be used to correct any excessive pronation that the patient has. Bunions. A bunion is also known as a hallux valgus deformity. The etiology. An exostosis or bony outgrowth occurs in the first metatarsal head of the foot. This is associated with forefoot varus. Most commonly, patients develop this from shoes that are too narrow, pointed, or too short. The bursa around this joint can become inflamed and thickens, which enlarges the joint and causes the lateral malalignment of the great toe. A bunionette is also known as a tailor's bunion, and instead of the big toe, it impacts the fifth metatarsal phalangeal joint, so the pinky toe, and causes a medial displacement of the fifth toe. For bunions or bunionettes, common signs and symptoms include tenderness, swelling, and enlargement of the joint. As the inflammation continues, the angulation increases, causing painful walking, running, or movement. Tendinitis in the great toe flexors may develop for bunions. 
For management, early recognition and care is critical. Encouraging our patients to wear correctly fitting shoes, appropriate orthotics, placing a pad over the first or the fifth metatarsal phalangeal joint, and tape splints between the first and second toes can help. We often ask our patients to engage in foot exercises for intrinsic and extrinsic muscle strengthening. A bunionectomy for a bunion or a bunionette, where they go in and shave down the bone, may be necessary if the conditions persist. Metatarsalgia. This is pain in the ball of the foot, typically between the second and the third metatarsal heads. This restricts the extensibility of the gastrocnemius and soleus complex. This is emphasized during the toe-off phase of gait, and people will often complain during this gait pattern. There is typically a fallen metatarsal arch that is associated with this condition. Signs and symptoms include a transverse arch that is flattened, a depression of the second, third, or fourth metatarsal bones, and a resulting pain. A pes cavus foot may also cause problems for individuals with metatarsalgia. The management for metatarsalgia includes elevating the depressed metatarsal head or the medial aspect of the calcaneus as it is needed. We may need to remove excessive callus buildup on the bottom of an individual's foot, and stretching of the Achilles tendon and strengthening of the intrinsic foot musculature can help. Toe deformities. The etiology for hammer toe is a flexible deformity that can become fixed due to a flexion contracture at the proximal interphalangeal joint. The proximal interphalangeal joint is commonly known as the PIP or the PIP joint. A mallet toe is caused by a flexion contracture at the distal interphalangeal joint, which can also become fixed. The distal interphalangeal joint or DIP is also known as a dip joint. A claw toe is a flexion contracture of the DIP joint but there is hyperextension at the metatarsophalangeal joint, or the MP joint. These conditions are frequently caused by wearing short shoes over an extended period of time. Mallet toe, hammer toe, and claw toe are often associated with athletic activities. As athletes cut and change directions, sometimes their toes slam into the end of their shoes, resulting in these different types of toe deformities. The signs and symptoms of toe deformities. The metatarsal phalangeal joint, DIP and PIP can all become fixed, or they can exhibit swelling, pain, callus formation, and occasionally infection. The management for these three different types of toe deformities is conservative treatment and involves wearing footwear with more room for the toes. We can use padding and taping to prevent irritation. Shave off any excessive calluses. Unfortunately, surgery is the only way to correct these types of conditions. Overlapping toes. The etiology, it may be congenital, which means individuals are born with it, or it may be brought upon by improperly fitting footwear, such as narrow shoes. Signs and symptoms include the outward projection of the great toe articulation or a drop in the longitudinal arch. The management for overlapping toes is similar to toe deformity, and unfortunately, surgery is the only cure to fix an overlapping toe. Some modalities, such as whirlpool baths, can assist in alleviating inflammation for an individual and taping may prevent some of the contractural tension within a sports shoe. However, surgery is still the only cure.